All right, guys, one thing I mentioned at the beginning of every single webinar, watch this again if uh, you're new to options trading or new to this strategy. If you haven't seen how I teach, watch this again because some of the nuances that I'm talking about are gonna fly by you, especially if you're thinking of a question or a question's popped up. You're gonna miss a few things going through, all right? So watch it again because second time through, maybe some of your questions get answered there and or you find the information that you may have missed before. So watch it again because you will also remember this longer if you watch it again relatively soon after. If you wait a month down the road, it's gonna be kind of like you're learning all of the rules over again. Okay. All right, so creating a synthetic stock long or long stock position. And this is gonna be great because I actually am in the market assumption that we are starting to uh, break out of this bearish pattern, especially after uh, yesterday's market action. Today, you know, we got a bit of a pullback, but I think that that is actually a healthy pause in a sense. So a little bit of jockeying back around, but I think the risk is to the upside. So it's a good uh, opportunity for this particular strategy. All right, uh, let me go over a couple of things real quick. My name is Eric Wilkinson. Some of you guys may recognize me from CNBC, Fox Business, or even the Wall Street Journal for commentary on everything from economic to geopolitical and market analysis. I've been trading my own money since college with some money I had earned. And then after switching my degree from psychology to finance, I moved to Chicago uh, after graduating and started working on the floor of the Board of Trade. Sold all my stocks that I had been trading in college and bought myself a badge jumped in the pits and started trading from there too. So bottom line is any opinions, news, research and analysis or other information contained here or material provided by pro trader strategies and or associated companies or employees does not constitute investment advice or solicitation to buy or sell any of these securities or strategies. I'm gonna be talking about stocks, you guys, that I may have in my portfolio and I'm not just you doing that to try and get you guys to limbing off the cliff with me. It's because that's what my market assumption is on a lot of these things. So uh, we may talk about some stocks that I have and I may be bullish in them uh, following along this line. So don't think that I'm just trying to get you guys to jump off the cliff with me. I'm just trying to uh, teach you guys how to do this the best way I know how. And remember that past perform, or sorry, please remember the past performance of any trading system or methodology is not necessarily indicative of future results. All right, you can follow me on Twitter at Wolfman's blog, especially during earnings. I tweet out my earnings trades because I do those at the end of the day. If you watch any of the uh, earnings webinars, you know how I trade those. I put those on in the afternoon. I do the daily market commentaries where I talk about all my trades in the morning. But this kind of trade I like to put on in the afternoon. So I'll tweet that out. Um, it's up to you guys to know what the rules are, though. I might, like, for instance, today say I sold puts in Disney for the bullish side. What strike am I selling? The 16 Delta. Well, as close to the 16 Delta as we can get. And I did the 18 Delta. So um, uh, that being said, all I tweeted out was that I sold puts. You guys should know I'm shooting for right around that 16 Delta, okay? Uh, you have to leave early, but would pre Banu would like to receive the recording. We'll do it, Banu. We'll send it off to you. Um, Ted, I'll read that in a minute here. I don't have, I, I don't have the bandwidth to, uh, to take care of that one right now. So a synthetic stock position. What is a synthetic stock position, you guys? Basically, what we're going to do is we are going to use options to create a long stock position. So yes, you can go out there and, you know, rather than go through the headache of doing options and go out there and simply buy the stock, okay? Well, think about it this way. If you bought a $100 stock 100 times, that's going to cost you about $10,000. That's assuming you aren't trading on margin for your stock, all right? If you're trading on margin for your stock, though, you, you might get a 50% cut. So, you know, on that $10,000, uh, you know, 100 contracts on a $100 stock, that's going to cost you about $10,000. If you're allowed to trade on margin, it's going to be about... Um, maybe half of that at best. So $5,000 to buy that. Well, with options, we're going to be able to do that for even half of that. So $2,500. So 75% less than what a normal person would have to, uh, you know, 
put up to buy the stock and 50% less than what somebody is trading stock on margin. So I know a lot of people like to trade, um, you know, for the short move or intraday scalping and stuff like that. And options is a great way to facilitate that type of trade, especially if you're trading with a smaller portfolio, right? I mean, if, if you only had $10,000 in a trading account, that would be 100% of your portfolio. And you don't want to do that. You want to be able to build a portfolio of multiple stocks in order to have diversified risk. And having all your eggs in one basket is not diversifying. So if you're trading with a smaller uh, account value or a portfolio, this is something you should really consider. And even if you have, I mean, everybody is always constantly worried about how much money is in their portfolio. It doesn't matter if you have necessarily $100,000 or you know $10 million. That guy that has $10 million in his account could diversify better if he would just use options rather than stock, okay? You, there are some upsides and downsides that I'll talk about here. So this is great for oversold stocks. It's almost like throw a dart at the dartboard right now to find oversold stocks. So great opportunity for this right now. Bullish assumption. I have a bullish assumption. I've talked about this in the daily market commentaries. Even after that first move down that we saw in the equities, let me just pull up in equities. Uh, even on this first pull down, this is where I was telling people uh, to buy the FANG stocks, especially older people that uh, don't have FANGs or um, you know their, their uh, advisor thinks that tech stocks are too risky for somebody in their 60s and 70s. Well, at the end of the day, those are the blue chip stocks of um, tech. And I don't see that those are an issue for older people to have in their portfolio, to be quite honest. I'm not saying that they need to allocate, you know, 25% to FANG stocks. You know, if you're older, that much older, I would say five, maybe 10, depending on your risk parameters, uh, would be a good opportunity. I told my stepfather and everybody in my family, buy here and buy them again here. Uh, I don't know if they did or not, but, you know, that's what I was saying to do. All right, so uh, bullish assumption. I have a bullish assumption. That works for this one. Bull markets works. If you're just in a constant trend like we've seen in the last, you know, up until a few weeks ago, it was just constantly trending higher. If you are bullish, have a bullish assumption, or we're in a bullish trend, this is all going to be great for building a synthetic stocks. And as I mentioned, the smaller portfolios, you guys can all uh, always diversify more. There's you, you can't diversify enough, to be quite honest. Um, so great for smaller portfolios, people that are struggling with trading, maybe a, a Tesla or that the, the bigger price stocks, right? Maybe you want to trade a $50 stock, but you don't have the margin. Well, you could do it if you use uh, options, all right? And it's great for newer traders to options. This is a very simple uh, strategy to set up to implement and to understand. So it's great for a newer trader, despite the fact that we're selling a short put in here and it's naked and everybody is gonna freak out probably. Oh my God, you're selling a naked short option. Uh, the risk has gotta be through the roof. The risk on this strategy, the synthetic long stock is actually uh, slightly less in a sense uh, from that of the buying a stock outright. The reason why is because we can do so many things. We can be very mechanical with this strategy and do a lot of different tweaking in order to be profitable with this trade, which increases your probabilities of success. If you go out and buy a stock, you're beholden to that move of the stock. With the options, we have a lot of different opportunities to play around with different things in order to uh, increase our probabilities of success, which I will talk about. Um, in it here in a minute. I did get the oversold stock. What? I did get the oversold stock. I don't get that, uh, Trevor, because you got a question mark at the end there. Um, all right. So risk reward of the long stock position is basically the same as the stock position. So we have that going for us. You're going to, I talked about this, use about 75% less capital. That's obviously assuming you don't 
have uh, the ability to trade on margin, just stocks on margin. If you do, it's going to be about 50% less than that. You know, if you, like I said, it's $10,000 on a hundred dollar stock uh, for a hundred contracts. Some of you guys might get away with only putting up $5,000. Uh, us options traders only put up 2,500. Okay. So that's where I'm coming up with that math. math. And obviously if we, are using less capital, but we have the same profit or loss uh, risk parameters. Then if we're using less capital, but our risk, re our risk and reward are the same, our return on capital is much, much higher. A lot of people like to use return on capital because that talks about leverage and how you're able to make money in a sense. So this is going to have about the highest return on capital that you can come up with for uh, you know a long stock position, all right? So to build this, what we're doing is we're gonna be buying the at the money call and then selling the at the money put, the closest to it. They're not always going to be, um, oh, what did you mean by oversold stocks? Uh, what I mean by oversold stocks is usually after a 10% correction, which is exactly why I was telling uh, my family, because it was pretty darn close to it, the 10% correction here. I said, buy a 10% correction here. And if it corrects 10% more, do it again. If you get a bump, when we get this bump down, buy it 10% down. And if it goes down further, buy it again. And I told them to buy at this level here and about right here. I was a little early, obviously, on the first one, but. Um, as you guys know, if you watch the daily market commentaries, I'm usually a little early. And I am prayed. I like to be early. All right, so you're buying the out the money call and selling the out the money put. The uh, ones that are as close to out the money as we can, all right? So, um, and what we're gonna do is try to build this so it's delta neutral and those out the monies, the close to out the monies are gonna show us that. All right, keys to success. Picking the right environment. now. Mid-range is a great place for starting this synthetic long or synthetic short because basically according to my rules, there's a, not a lot of opportunity when vol is mid-range. With my rules for, let's say, you know, a bullish assumption selling, you know, calls or, or sorry, selling puts in the bullish assumption um, and things of that nature, doing an iron condor and stuff like that. Those strategies you know, can be put around this mid range. It fits my rules, but this is a better choice for that because when it's mid range, we really don't know necessarily if it's going to go higher or lower when they're at extremes, then we have a pretty darn good assumption that when they're at the extremes, cause we will see when we start pulling up these volatility charts uh, for the stocks, you'll see that they have a basic ceiling and a basic floor. And it doesn't mean that it can't go through the ceiling and the floor. Yes, most people say that you can't, but there, you're gonna see a ceiling and a floor. Sometimes it'll go into the basement and sometimes it'll go into the attic, okay? But uh, the basic rule of thumb is gonna be that when it hits that ceiling or floor, it's gonna wanna go back to the mid range, which is what we're looking for for this strategy. The reason why is we don't have to worry about volatility so much with this one because we are offsetting volatility and theta and a bunch of the other ones. That's what makes this one good for uh, a mid range implied volatility. All right. It doesn't mean you can't do this with super low implied volatility or super high implied volatility. Yes, you can. But when I'm doing this whole series on low volatility, medium volatility and high volatility, the medium volatility is really that area that you guys notice I shy away from a lot of times, uh, unless I'm doing like a synthetic long or synthetic short because of those reasons I just talked about. When it's mid range, I don't know if it's gonna go up or down. So um, it's a coin toss. And I like to have a little bit better probabilities than 50-50, okay? Now, no, your probabilities of success with a synthetic long stock is the same probabilities of success as with a stock, okay? It's 50-50. When you buy a stock, it's a 50-50 probability it will go up and it's a 50-50 probability it will go down, all right? Those are the probabilities. And when I talk about options, you 
know I talk about the probabilities quite uh, extensively. So picking the right environment, we want about mid-range, not to say that uh, you couldn't do it in a high implied volatility or low implied volatility. I don't want to uh, confuse that issue. But the sweet spot for me, for all of my options that I have rules for, this is my go-to when it is mid-range because I don't want to have to worry about it uh, hurting me or necessarily helping me in that regard. Okay, so I'm going to offset most of those. So this is if you have a bullish assumption and in a bullish assumption in a particular underlying all right, that has an ID percent of 50, then I would probably lean towards this rather than just going out and selling puts or anything else. Uh, does, the, does the medium volatility mean that you can get more for the puts? Well, when it's medium volatility, you aren't necessarily going to get more for the puts. The, when you get more for the puts, it's usually when they're skewed to it, more for the puts than the calls. Uh, but as volatility increases, the puts will naturally have a tendency to increase in value as well. That will help us when we are selling those puts to finance the calls, right? So uh, that will definitely help. Uh, if you sell the at the money puts, will you make only what you get for the puts? No, you are going to get dollar for dollar what the stock does. That means if the stock goes up by a dollar, you're going to receive a dollar increase in your portfolio. All right. Reflective of that. You know, if you do a hundred contracts, you know, obviously it's going to be a hundred dollars, right? Well, one, one, uh, one option is a hundred underlying. So like if you did 10 synthetic long stocks, then basically you are getting long a thousand of the stock. Okay. And it would participate dollar for dollar with that. Now, it's going to get off here and there. Sometimes, as a matter of fact, one of the uh, uh, ones I vetted for today, uh, I was long 100, I think, in three deltas. Well, if you buy 100 stock, that means you are long 100 deltas, okay? If you short 100 stock, that means you are short 100 deltas, all right? If you're long 1,000 stock, you're long 1,000 deltas. It's that easy. If you're long one stock, you're long one delta, all right? So that is how we come up with uh, the, the building out of this strategy is we want to try and get close to 100 deltas so that we get that exact same dollar for dollar move that we would get with a synthetic stock. So you buy a call and sell a put both at a 50 delta. Banu, if the mark, the only way you're really going to be able to do that, let's say XYZ was trading 60 and you are doing the 60 calls and 60 puts. That's almost the only time you're gonna get 50 delta on the calls and 50 on the puts. What I wanna do is try and build this out so that we have uh, a total of 100 deltas. And I'll go into that here in a second. All right, so picking the right underline. Uh, actually, let me go back to this just to explain the volatility, uh, the, for some of the newer people, the um, implied volatility percent that I'm talking about here. So when we pull up a chart, I always have, a chart of implied volatility down here. And what I'm talking about, you can see Disney is right around uh, 58.67 implied volatility percent. Now, how does that number come about? What we do is we take a fraction and in the numerator, we take the sum of where the current implied volatility is now minus the low. And in this case, that would be 10. Right, 26 minus 16 is 10. And in the denominator, we take the high minus the low, which is 30, uh, I'm blind, 33. So 33 minus 16 is going to be 17. So 10 divided by 17 is going to give us right around 58%. Okay, so that's how you do it. In the numerator where the current implied volatility is minus the low, and take that sum and divide it by the sum of the high minus the low. And that gives you implied volatility percent. That tells you where it is currently in relationship to where it has been in the past. And as you can see, you know, it has a basic floor and a ceiling. Basic ceiling being right up here, to the highs that we're seeing right here at 33, and the basic low somewhere down here 
uh, around 16, you can see. So it doesn't always go down there and tag the exact same spot, but you can see it's kind of like a chart where you'll have your extreme highs and extreme lows. And every single underlying, every single individual stock will have its own implied volatility, all right? So just because you know Disney is trading right here at 26 and that's a 56% IV or IV percent, we can look at the emerging markets one and it's trading at a uh, 58% as well. And that mid range is um, pretty close to the last one, but you'll see something like with let's say uh, Tesla, if I can throw Tesla up here real quick. I wanted to get something that had the exact same implied volatility percent and that didn't work, um, was hoping. Uh, but you can see this, uh, Tesla is trading at an implied volatility percent of, without me having to do the math in my head, we can go also over to the uh, platform here and see that it's a 32 IV percent. It's doing the same math all the way out, further decimals than what I'm rounding it up to be. So uh, keep that in mind. So, but you can see that this is at a 32 IV percentile and it's trading at a 60 implied volatility. So the last example of Disney never gets as high as 60 implied volatility and it was at a 50%, it was mid range, right? The high we saw was 33. The low here is gonna be like 33. So the low implied volatility for Tesla is the extreme, most extreme high we've seen in Disney in the last 52 weeks. So you have to compare apples to apples when you're looking at implied volatility. You're not looking at the VIX. The VIX will give you an indication that volatility across the board is increasing, all right? So that's a good indicator of what uh, volatility is happening to the rest of ours. But what we really want to look at is the implied volatility percent to see when it's at you know, these extreme highs, if it's at 80%, you know, you, it's at an extreme high. And then when it's at 1%, you know, it's at the extreme lows, right? So, and we can see when it gets to these extreme lows, it wants to crawl back higher, all right? It's always going to try and crawl back higher. You get crushed on the uh, on earnings and stuff like that, but the volatility goes higher. I got a little off subject there, but that's what I'm talking about, a 50 IV percent, somewhere mid-range, not to say, again, that you can't do this with high implied volatility and low implied volatility because we are going to be offsetting that, all right? So uh, before I get into the weeds with that, so uh, now picking the right underlying. What we do is we look at a stock and any stock over $100, we take the decimal, move it three ticks to the left. That's how wide the option montage should be saying the bid to the ask is for each stock or each uh, strike. I'm sorry. So we go to the monthlies and like to go to the monthlies with the most volume and open interest. That's probably not going to be this one. So let's go a little bit further out. 48 days to expiration is probably the wheelhouse that has the most participation. And what do we say? Move three ticks to the left. 35 cents is how wide these bid ask should be. And you can see Tesla right at the money is pretty close to that. Um, generally speaking, during market trading hours, you will see the ones that are the monthlies that closest to the expiration fits that rule. I thought being about 45 days, people are gonna start moving from the uh, November into the December. So these will start tightening up, but this rule applies to the monthlies that are closest to expiration and that would be the November. Now we can look at a stock under $100, and my rule of thumb on this one, uh, win is all over the board because they just had earnings. So let's look at a different one. Um, st stock under $100, uh, Cisco, let's look at that. Uh, my rule of thumb on a stock under $100 is 10 cents wide. So we go down to the option montage with the monthlies and see that those are fitting that rule. So before we trade options on any individual underlying, follow that rule, okay? That's a green light. If you guys are options traders or have been trading options and are a little bit, or maybe even there's a particular underlying that you're comfortable trading, but it doesn't fit that rule. I'm not saying you can't trade options around that, all right? What I'm saying is you have to be very careful. The wider the bid ask is, the more edge you have to give up to get in and the more edge you have to give up to get out, all right? And that eats into 
your profitability over the long haul, all right? Um, but if you are willing to accept those higher risks, then I'm not one to say you can't do it. I'm not going to trade those very often. Well, you, something like win and stuff like that, I will, but uh, usually during day uh, open market uh, operations that has a lot tighter market. All right, then picking the right duration. Now with the selling option strategies, you know I talk about that really accelerated theta decay and stuff like that. With this one, the right duration, we just wanna pick enough time to be right, all right? It's going to end up costing you about the same amount. Uh, it's, it's going to price in around the same spots if you do the eight days to expiration as opposed to the 100 days to expiration. And if I am bullish in this, I probably want to give myself a lot more time to be right if I don't have to worry about those ancillary costs, right? I mean, and even if it costs me an extra 25 cents, I would rather have an extra 90 some days uh, to be right than, uh, than not have to pay that extra quarter, right? So picking the right duration, I'm picking something as far out as I can to be right, okay? It doesn't matter to me. We can look at an example here. We were talking about doing the at the monies. So this is trading 4840. It's kind of a pick them right between them. But uh, what I was talking about with the deltas, I'll go over this real quick because this is gonna be the next slide. I might as well do it. But um, if we buy this one and sell the puts, right? We bought the 48 calls, sell the 48 puts. It's gonna cost us a 46 cent debit, all right? So 46 cent debit, we have to add to this. So basically we're buying Cisco at $48.46. You can see that that is right in between the bid and the ask. So we are buying this basically at the same prices we could have bought it in the open market operations. We can look at this and see if I did this as a one lot. If I do this as a one lot, my margin is $1,000. Now let's just go up here and do this and buy this one and confirm it. My margin is $2,000, okay? Because I'm trading on margin. Uh, if normally it would cost you about $4,000 if you weren't able to trade on margin, all right? So you can see those differences there. A lot more, uh, you know, you could do four times as many now. Uh, if, if you weren't worried about portfolio value and all those things, uh, maybe you were just thinking about, hey, I'm thinking about going from 100 lots to 200 lots. Well, you know, you could think about using options instead uh, while you're doing that to increase your exposure to that particular underlying. So back to this, we could see we did it as a 46 cent debit earlier. So let's just go out to like say the 71 days and we're going to do those same strikes, buying these, uh, okay, buying this one, selling that one, and it's 40 cents. So it's actually gotten cheaper. It's better to go further out. I'm buying this below the market the further out I go. It doesn't always work out that way. Uh, it's working out nicely for me right now, making me look like a genius, but it doesn't always work out. You can see I go out to the 161 days and it's back to that 46 cents. So would you rather have 161 days to be right, paying 46 cents for the same strategy or have eight days to be right? Right? Pretty no brainer. We would go with a longer duration. And in this regard, I'm almost never in a strategy for more than 70 days. I would probably go with uh, this one just to get it six cents cheaper. Not that that's a big deal, but I highly doubt I will be in this strategy for 71 days. So that would probably be the one I'm doing because I'm looking for a near term move. All right. I don't try and look at anything, uh, you know, six months out. I'm all inside of six months. If I have a trade on that is six months uh, in duration for the options, it's only because of something like this, where I might as well give myself the time to be right. Okay. That makes sense for everybody. So how do you get hurt? Well, one thing I forgot to mention here uh, is the downstrokes is you don't get a dividend, all right? When you're synthetic longs, you don't get a dividend, all right? 
So that's, that's a downstroke. How do you get hurt? If this market goes down, if we have a bullish assumption, this market goes down by $1, we lose $1 because it is dollar for dollar. Uh, the other thing that could happen is, um, I'm, I'm going to, I was going to wait to talk about this a little bit longer, but, um, I'll talk about it here in a second because I don't want to confuse anybody, but I'll talk about some of that stuff that ways that you're going to get hurt and how we are going to stay mechanical if those things start to hurt us. Okay. So I want to get all that done here in a second. And then picking the right strikes. We're doing the at the monies, pretty no brainer. Uh, not a whole lot to think about. We talked about this. I showed you an example of it, but what I was also talking about, and uh, I think this was Banu was asking about, uh, the deltas, what we're going to do is basic math here, all right? If we buy this option, in a sense, what I'm buying this as a one lot, if it was a one lot, I am buying the 48 strike. I'm buying 45, 40, sorry, 54 deltas. My dyslexia is showing up, I guess. My buy has long 54 deltas. And then I go over here and I sell these puts, right? I bought these calls, I buy the deltas. I sell these puts, I sell the negative deltas. So what happens in math when you have two negatives? It makes it a positive, right? 54 minus a negative 45 gives me 99. So I'm long 99 deltas in this example. It's one shy of going out and buying the 100 lot. So if this stock goes up by $1, our portfolio value or our position goes up by 99 cents, All right? Does that make sense? And I this math is all messed up because of, uh, I made that a one lot, sorry. So sell so 40 cents. So we're buying this under the market, but the downstroke of that is Sometimes our deltas get thrown off and it's not dollar for dollar, Trevor. That's another uh, aspect of this being sometimes not as good as a stock. But I don't care about that one penny, to be quite honest. I just saved myself 70, uh, or in this example, I just saved myself uh, $3,000 in margin. Yeah, you don't get that one penny when, the do when it moves up by a dollar though. All right, I'll take that. <laughs> All right, so... That's how we're trying to get along those deltas, as close to 100 as we possibly can, all right? So that's picking the right strikes. That's how you figure out those deltas to get it close to 100 as you possibly can. All right, knowing our exit strategy. Trevor, this is where you're coming in. Our exit strategy, for one, is gonna depend on your risk parameters. And I don't know what your risk parameters are, uh, but what I usually do is use targets, right? And I'm sure you guys are probably very similar to that as well where you may have a Fibonacci or something like that. Of course, is my Fibonacci up? Maybe you have a Fibonacci and you're like, okay, I just think it's gonna go up and test the high. Well, then that would be your exit, right? When it's trading 49 or 50, as soon as it goes up there and hits it. However, you that would be my thing is I would look for one of those or maybe you uh, would do an extension and look at that level. You know, wherever you've, you're, you've got a bullish market assumption, Wherever you think it's gonna go is where you get out, wherever your risk parameters are. Maybe you're gonna ride this out for a couple of months because you're long-term bullish it, right? Th however you're going to do that, uh, that's up to you. Um, I talk about different ways for people to have exit strategies in my webinars or in my daily market commentaries here and in most webinars. But here, this one's a little bit finicky because it's more of a target, right? Because we are synthetically long. We have a bullish market assumption. I can't tell you exactly where to get out of here. You know, if you have a measured move where, okay, you know, Steve Primo does that a lot. You have the measured move and up to there and that's where you get out. However you do that uh, is fine by me, okay? So, but know that when you're doing an exit strategy, that you should write that stuff down. One thing I've meant, forgotten to mention in a couple of these webinars is keep track of all of your trades, write them down so that you have the data easily to go back and look at. Yeah, you can go through all your trade history and all that stuff, but I think it's a little bit better because you can make notes in a notebook as to why you were bullish, 
what your, uh, you know, like what your assumption was, what your strikes were, what made you get into this, all of those things, right? So you can go back and see maybe what you did wrong, or uh, at least you have data to know what works and what doesn't work, okay? So write all of those trades down and especially write down your exit, all right? Your price you're gonna exit. If you write it down, you're more likely to get out at those levels and don't second guess yourself. Never go back and look the next day to see, oh, was I right? Yes, you were right. You told yourself two weeks ago you were getting out at this level. It went to that level. You're right. Don't second guess it. Don't look back and say, well, could I squeeze out an extra couple of dollars? That's not what we're here to do. We're here. One thing we used to say on the floor, bulls make money, bears make money. Pigs get slaughtered. And what that really refers to is when you were right and you basically should have gotten out and you didn't and you lost money, you basically got slaughtered. All right. So stick to your trading plan. Write it down. If you put it down on paper, you're more likely to stick to it. If it's in your head, you're going to be like, well, maybe I'll wait till tomorrow. All right. Just get out. Of it, all right. Uh, what's up, Jesse? Good to see you're here. We are recording this. So uh, you will be getting a re you will receive a uh, recording, be able to watch this again. So uh, don't worry about that too much. Um, so Marcus is ask, asking, how do we manage this if it goes against us? What happens when it goes down, right? Well, the thing we're going to have to worry about are these puts, right? Because we're short puts. And when we're short puts, we have the obligation if the buyer wants to give us that stock at that level, right? They want to sell us their stock at that level. It means we would have to buy it at 48. If the market goes down and it's trading around 42, we do have risk of being assigned on these 48s. And if we get assigned on these 48s, we're going to be long now 100 of the stock. So we're going to be flipped. We're going to get flipped really quick, right? Because these options are now going to be 100 deltas. Even if we did... Uh, it has 45 deltas. As soon as we get assigned on that, we're long 100 deltas. And if we're still long these 48 calls, that means we're still long whatever delta they are. It's going to be a lot less because, you know, they're out of the money. It's going to be 13 or so. But know that we are going to be all of a sudden longer deltas than just being that 100 lot, right? So what do we do? As soon as you get assigned if you get assigned, if you get assigned on a, uh, a put, that means you're long at the strike price. You're long these calls at that 48 strike price. What I do is immediately sell out of those calls, get out of them for whatever profit you can or whatever uh, price you can get out of. It's not going to be a profit. It's going to be a loss. And then flip to shorting it. All right. What do we do? All we've done is switched a synthetic long position into a covered call position because some meanie stuck us with their stock at 48 and now we're long stock a lot higher than where we are, which is what we were anyway in the beginning. But what we do now is we immediately flip the shorting calls and we collect a credit for that sell of those calls at the 48 level if this were the example, all right? So now what happens if the market goes up and blows through my 48s? Well, I shorted those calls. I have the obligation to give somebody those calls at 48. Well, I already have the stock. I'll just give them my stock. I'm out. I'm out for pretty much a scratch with all the fees and everything else. I, I would call that a scratch and I would be happy. In my book, a scratch is a winner, you guys. I never look back at a scratch and go, gosh, that was a crummy trade. Man, a scratch is a winner all day long. All right, so that's how we become mechanical. Did I answer your question on that one, Marcus? You got that? Everybody else understand how we do that? If somebody assigns us on those puts, we are now long 100 stock. That means we just got longer deltas than we really want to be, all right? Because we're long the 100 stock, which is a long 100 deltas. We're long the uh, 48 calls which is gonna have some long deltas in it. Immediately flip those to a short, collect a credit, 
lower our basis on what we paid for that stock because we paid 48 for it still. And now we're selling the 48 calls for whatever we can get. If we got 30 cents, then we would lower what we paid for that stock by 30 cents, okay? Does that make sense? Uh, short call at what delta? Uh, I Benu, I would be trying to hit those short calls at the same strike I was long. If I can only collect maybe five cents or something like that, I would probably go down to the next strike lower. Uh, sometimes you will be locking in a loss. Uh, that is true. But what I'm trying to do is just lower my basis. At that point, if I'm locking in a loss, I'm happy with that loss. Uh, the other thing is uh, I would be lowering my basis on what I paid for it. So if those calls expired worthless, I would have the opportunity to roll them out and uh, sideways or out and up, you know, which is what we're trying to do with any long call position is manage that risk. And if you have to go too far down where you're like, hey, you know what? That's just way too far down. I'd rather ride out the risk. I'm still bullish in this. Then, then don't do the covered calls. Just ride that stock out. Um, but I like to do the covered calls no matter what, just to lower my basis on any stock. All right. If we get assigned when the stock is at 40, we can then short it at 40 or do we short at 48? Great question, Chris. Now, if, if we were long this 48s, right? And the or long at 48 i should say if it was all the way down at 40 i would not sell those 40 calls uh that would be locked for me that would be locking in too much of a loss and at that point i would probably be thinking that i'm i'm bearish in this underlying and then anytime my market assumption has changed i want to close out that position right i don't care if i'm losing money if i my market assumption changes pull the ripcord get out for whatever you can and move on, forget about it. So the 40s would be a little bit too low. Let's say that it went down to, let's say 42, 43. I'm still probably gonna have to sell, you know, like the 47 calls. So in that regard, I would be locking in a loss because I'm long at 48, I'm short at 47, right? I'm, sh I'm locking in a loss of $1. I'm locking in a loss of $1 minus whatever collection I was able to collect for that. Uh, stop for that option, that 47 call, okay? So if I was able to collect 30 cents, then I've only locked in a loss of 70 cents. But if market didn't come back up and I locked, still locked in that loss and those 47 calls expired worthless, then the next month I could go out and either sell more 47 calls, lower my basis even more, or roll it back up to the 48 calls and collect another credit there. That's going to be your kind of pick them, right? So I wouldn't go too far because if it was way down here, I don't want to lock in that big of a loss. Uh, and if I was selling a call down that far, I would expect it not to go uh, back into the month or come back up. So in that case, I would pull the ripcord. If somebody was just like, hey, you know, it's trading right around here at 45, it's only three ticks in the money and they still did that to you. That is a possibility. Another thing is going further out in time, people are less likely to sign you uh, on the puts that far away. It's usually when you start getting inside of 35 days when people start doing that. Um, so this that's another reason to go further out in time because those those puts people probably aren't going to assign you on. But if they do, I would try and sell something for around 30 cents as long as I was comfortable with locking in a loss in the near term. Okay. All right. So we are, we are talking a lot today. So your max profit is just like a stock. It's infinite. It can go to infinity. It can, you can have a penny stock become an Amazon overnight. Um, so you're, you know, infinite is the upside potential. We aren't going to make it to infinity and beyond. <laughs> Max loss is if that underlying goes to zero. So it's just like a stock. A stock can go to infinity or a stock can go to zero. That's your risk profile. Only thing we really need to know is our call strike minus the credit is where our break even is or plus the debit. Now we did this when we were trying to figure out um, what we were paying for that underlying, right? So in uh, Cisco, for instance, we were uh, looking at the 
48. So I'm buying these calls, selling those. I'm long 99 deltas. That all works according to all my other rules. It's mid range, pretty close, right? Um, so we do this. I bought it at $48.40. Where's my break even? 48.40, right? Pretty simple. That's your break even. And I did it as a debit. So I had to add it. If I did it as a credit, then I would have to, I would be able to subtract it. So we, we can do it as a credit. We do this. So we're along the 49s. Now we subtract this 68 cents from those 49 calls. And that puts us at 42, right? $48.42 is our break even. That's where we synthetically bought that stock. So, you know, despite the fact that, um, we're using different strikes. It's pretty much about where we were uh, looking to buy the other one as well. The only thing that I would look at here to make my final decision would be as if I was able to do these 49s for uh, 100 deltas. I also always like to get a little bit of a credit. That's just my um, quirk about me is I would like to get a credit for anything. So I'd probably end up doing the 49s anyway. It's no big difference and no, it doesn't make a big difference in um, whether you get a credit or a debit in this instance, it doesn't make a big difference at all. Uh, it's just my um, quirkiness about wanting to always collect a credit. So let's look at one more example. I think it was IBM that I found an example of that had more than um, 100 deltas. So let's just check it out. So the at the money, 123.30. So it's a pick in between them. It's prob one could probably say it is the uh, 125s. But if we buy this one, we're buying 45 deltas and we sell this 125 put, we are selling negative 58 deltas. So 58 plus 45, you can see we're at 103 deltas long, right? Same thing would happen as if you did, did it with these. It looks like 40, 59 and 39. So uh, we're slightly shy by that one. 40 and 60, we're only long 98. So I would go with the 125s in this one. I'd rather be long a little bit more deltas, right? Somebody's throwing me an extra, um, somebody's throwing me an extra three deltas on the 125s, right? I get an extra three pennies every time it moves higher. Eventually, that might cover my uh, commissions. I'm good with that. So you can go, you can find uh, opportunities where you will be longer, more deltas. Uh, and if you did a 10 lot, you have to multiply your deltas times 10 or by however many you do, right? Because 100 deltas that we're talking about is based on a one lot. This would be long. Um, this would be long at one thousand and thirty deltas. Absolutely. Ben, who's asking? Can I analyze? For sure. So let's just analyze this one. Uh, let me go down to a one lot so we can see it all. So one lot buying the call, selling the put. Analyze the trade. Let's check it out. That's a butterfly from the last time. It's probably going to show my other option, short option position that I just put on today that I talked about in the daily market commentary. All right, so um, I don't want those being reflected. So you can see the purple line here. The purple line is what the actual stock would do. So you can see it, it tracks the stock pretty darn closely. You can see that this is where I lose a couple of deltas to the stock, right? Right off the bat. It actually should be the other way around. I should be gaining deltas because I'm long more deltas. I don't know why that's not showing up that way. Uh, but I should actually right in this wheelhouse be longer more deltas than this. I don't know why that analyzed tab is not showing me above the purple line. Um, because as it goes up, I should be gaining deltas at least for the first couple of dollars. Um, but you can see that it does track pretty darn closely to the... Uh, to the regular underlying, which is the purple. Okay. Uh, is there any disadvantage to the credit versus the debit? No, they're pretty much the same. 
I just have a quirk about me that I like the credit. All right, you guys, this is a new uh, training session that we got set up for you guys. This is a special uh, options training course offer. Basically, it comes in with a bunch of newer stuff. We have some of the older ones listed here because I wanted to make sure it was important to put these together this way. When we're doing these strategies and this, if you guys are attending all of these synthetic law, or uh, sorry, the volatility uh, series, these aren't going to be talked about in the volatility series. So you guys should take advantage of this, especially if you've learned anything about uh, or learned anything from me today. If you guys like to trade with probabilities, higher probabilities of success than what you're going to be getting elsewhere, or how even learning how to increase those probabilities of success. That's what I talk about constantly with me being mechanical and setting up these strategies in the proper environment and in and around my rules will increase your success rate, you guys. So this link, uh, I don't have it in there right now. Let me get it in there. Somebody said they don't see the link. And that's because I don't have it in there. All right, so let me throw it in there real quick. Um, chat window drop. So this is the new uh, offer. It's in the chat window. We've been going back and forth on the questions windows. You got to look over there on that chat box over there. Uh, this is the link. If you're watching this on tape delay for this offer, you'll have to type it into your URL. It's not a hot link or anything like that. But basically, you guys... Uh, Fun one, history of options. I love that one. Um, but one of the most important things we can talk about is protecting your portfolio against rising interest rate. This one webinar alone is worth the $36 in my eyes. It's probably worth the $1,000 in and of itself, you guys, because we are in a rising interest rate environment. Yes, we had uh, a pause at this FOMC meeting, but the the likelihood trajectory of interest rates is up. And if interest rates go up, portfolio, uh, the portfolio side of your, uh, or the, sorry, the bond portfolio side of your portfolio is going to get decimated. And it's the least um, uh, watched aspect of anybody's portfolio. You get those bonds in there, you just sit on them. But now we're in a rising interest rate environment. Somebody might be going, hey, I got a 3% bond. I want a 5% bond. Well, you can't sell that 3% bond and buy that 5% bond and make up the difference. The price of that 3% bond is going to be dirt cheap that you're going to have to sell it at because the guy buying it knows what you're doing. He knows you're chasing yield, so he's going to make you eat it. And then when you go out and buy that 5% bond, you're going to have to have about seven to eight years of coupon payments to make up for the loss on the one that you sold, okay? After that seven, eight years, yeah, then uh, then you get that extra, you know, $100 uh, in the coupon payment. But is that worth it? No. In the meantime, you could be doing what I talked about the whole time and actually being mechanical and increasing your portfolio value at the same time, offsetting that risk and uh, in income generation. All of these are great, you guys, for 36 bucks. I highly recommend it. Um, and the best way to become a better trader is to constantly learn. And you guys have obviously done that for by attending this. But wouldn't you say that just knowing how to create a synthetic long strategy isn't enough to con create consistent winners? Basically, what I talk about is trading probabilities and becoming more mechanical is the way to get ahead in this game. Anyone can teach you how to build a strategy, but no one else is going to show you guys how to set up these strategies to increase your probabilities of success. And if you guys noticed in this webinar alone, that's what I talk about a lot. And volatility. Nobody else really talks about volatility. Even the talking heads on CNBC, I see talk about buying calls in really high implied or in, in really high uh, volatile markets, which is the wrong thing to do. It's the wrong strategy. I don't care what underlying it is. It's the wrong strategy. All right. So if you're using the right tools for the right situation, you guys will become more or be, have a more productive state of mind. You'll be able to put on more strategies. And when you were able to put on more strategies, that creates more opportunities, just like what I was talking about this. Lower what your uh, margin is to be able to add more opportunity. It increases your 
uh, diversification, all right, and hedging, all right? You're not beholden to one move or one sector, all right? Ultimately, this is going to create confidence and allow you guys to free up a little bit more, all right? So take advantage of that. One last thing, Trevor, I see you popped up a question or somebody popped up a couple questions. I'll look at them here in a second. Uh, I want to thank you guys all. Here is also that link. It's in the chat window. If you're attending right now, if you are watching this on tape delay, then you're going to have to pause, punch this into your URL. Later webinars are dr drilled down on different option components and how to trade those options. Trades I find, when and where I find them appropriate. Also, uh, that's the link. Thanks for watching. You can contact us at 310-598-6677 or email us at trading at protraderstrategies.com. All right, so take advantage of this. Seriously, guys, 36 bucks. I'm telling you, if you aren't jumping on this portfolio protection, then, you know, don't be calling me. All right, so Trevor is asking, uh, I analyze, or, so when do you get out? If that risk is really, you know, when do you get out of a stock? It's a hard question to answer. For me, IBM, I, I got, I shorted puts in this a few days back when we had higher implied volatility. So I'm bullish IBM. Um, if I were getting long this stock, my, my exit would probably be right here. It's not the value area low. It's not this retracement. It's just to cover this gap. That's what I would look for this to happen. So for me, it's going to be maybe different than somebody else, right? I can't really tell you where the exit is on a long stock. It's going to go back to, um, you know, how you guys like to get. I can tell you where I'm going to get out. Uh, and that's exactly where I would get out. And it's going to pretty much lie differently, you know, for each individual underlying that I trade, you know. I don't know that I would do it on Caterpillar. There's a gap. I think it's probably going to get covered on gap Caterpillar before it goes higher. Um, uh, Disney, I'm bullish. Let's see where I would get out of Disney. I'd probably look at Disney and do something like a um, uh, an extension on this one because it's so close to the highs. So let's do a Fibonacci extension real quick and dirty. I'm just going to try and do uh, this measure move from here to I want to do this one. Are you going to give it to me? To here. All right. So there's my measured move from that first pullback to make it uh, slightly go down. We're lined up there, right here, 61. That's probably where I'd get out. I just slightly new high. So I'd be saying, all right, we get 120. 120 handle prints, I'm out. Okay. All right, a couple of, so that's about it. You guys click on that, uh, take advantage of it. I'll get a couple more questions out of the way um, before I stop recording here. Um, I answered the when to get out. Uh, why did the markets pull back a little since interest rates didn't go up? Today, if we're talking about the interest or the market pulled back a little bit today, I mean, yesterday's massive rally, people were begging to get out today. I'm sure there were, you know, GTCs in there overnight. I don't know. But, I, you know, anytime you see those big rallies like we had yesterday, I wasn't surprised at all to see this uh, market action that we saw today. I think it's actually a good thing. I think it actually went here. Actually, let's look at the Dow because um, the Dow, this is the index. So it doesn't show the overnight, right? Like we would have with the futures. And this gap, like it, as soon as we got up above the value area high, the shorts were on their heels. And then they popped it above this Fibonacci extension, right? And then it blew through the 50-day moving average, right? All the way up. Today, we got this little dinghy. Yeah, some people could say that looks like a top. To me, this bullish move yesterday, that was just weak hands taking profits. That's the day traders, the scalpers or whatever getting out. I think before it's said and done, we're at least testing this 50 Fibonacci extension before we make any kind of pullback to try and cover this gap. It's just too bullish. Usually I'm looking right away for gaps to get covered. This one, the way that market acted, to me, it, it feels pretty bullish right now. So um, if you're asking about that pullback with the interest rates, I, I think most of this has been a tantrum on interest rates 
like all of these Fed governors heading into the FOMC. When did the Fed governors stop talking? Well, they can't talk. I think it's uh, at least like maybe two weeks before uh, the FOMC. They're not allowed to talk about uh, policy in public. So this pullback, I think, was a tantrum when they're all talking about we're going to continue to interest, increase interest rates. Da, 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 da. And then when all the rhetoric stopped, and we get a pause. The market started coming back a little bit. But that was uh, that was my um, that's my assumption there. Uh, death cross on Nasdaq. The death cross on NASDAQ, where is that? I don't know what that is, actually, to be quite honest. I've heard of like a golden cross where the 50-day and the 200-day move cr cross each other. But what's the death cross? Um, how about tomorrow? Up or down, your take? I'm saying up. As a matter of fact, I, I, sh I got long deltas today by selling puts in Amazon and, and uh, IBM. I'm long deltas in my portfolio. They didn't increase interest rates because Trump would get upset. That's why they are increasing interest rates. They're driving crazy. No. Uh, um, they're funny. All right. That's about it. I don't see any more questions popping up. So I'm going to cut it out for you guys so you don't have to stick around anymore. That's about it. Other than if you can't take that, take it easy. Take care, guys. Thanks, KM. Thanks, Trevor. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Keith. Appreciate all the kind words, you guys. Bye now.